Its growth and development over the past 15 years has been dramatic, if not miraculous, owing in large part to the work of tens of thousands of ambassadors for peace, peace activists, and volunteers who draw from all nationalities, religions, ethnicities, cultures, and traditions, bound together by a vision of peace, a vision of humanity as one global family under one God. The range of programs over the years has been both broad and expansive, from character education to strengthening the family, from conflict prevention to conflict resolution, from poverty reduction to environmental stewardship, from interfaith dialogue to youth service initiatives, from support of the United Nations to partnerships with the African Union and a wide range of international organizations and NGOs. UPF has a global, multinational, multi-faith network of more than 100,000 ambassadors for peace who support and contribute to the mission and works of UPF. Recording in progress. UPF's highest award, the Leadership and Good Governance Award, has been given to distinguished leaders the world over. The World Summit Series is UPF's flagship program involving the highest level of leaders from around the globe, including current and former heads of state and government, to address the critical challenges facing humanity. Very appropriate that we are here on the 100th anniversary of Reverend Moon's birth, because out of the devastation of World War II and the Korean War, he and his bride found the courage to dream that they could achieve something. And it is amazing what they have created together. Programs have been successfully held in Korea, the USA, Senegal, South Africa, Nepal, Cambodia, and other nations. The most recent structural innovation within UPF has been the creation of a set of associations dedicated to collaboration among leaders from various fields. These pillar associations are the International Summit Council for Peace was initiated by UPF co-founder Dr. Hak Jahan Moon in 2019 on the occasion of World Summit 2019 in Seoul, Korea. ISCP is an international network of current and former heads of state and government. The International Association of First Ladies, IAFLP, a project of the ISCP, affirms and uplifts the unique role of First Ladies in contributing to peace and development. IAFLP brings together current and former First Ladies from throughout the world drawing upon their experience and wisdom as women leaders and as role models who serve their countries in significant ways. The International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace, IAPP, is a worldwide association of parliamentarians which provides a forum to bring their experience and wisdom to bear in the search for solutions to our world's problems. UPF maintains that any successful strategy for peace must take into account the spiritual dimension of our human identity, experience, and interactions. Based on this worldview, UPF initiated the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, IAPD. The International Media Association for Peace, IMAP, represents a worldwide professional network of journalists who support a socially responsible and moral media. IMAP recognizes the vital role that journalists play in providing objective reporting to foster an informed citizenship. The International Association of Academicians for Peace IAAP, is a global interdisciplinary academic initiative aimed at contributing toward the realization of a world of lasting peace. 
IAAP is dedicated to building professional networks for academicians to foster a world of peace. The International Association for Peace and Economic Development, IAED, affirms the role of businesses, business leaders, and investors to make the world a better place. In early 2020, UPF convened a Rally of Hope featuring dignitaries including Pastor Paula White, Cambodia Head of State His Excellency Hun Sen, President Macky Sall of Senegal, former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, former U.S. Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, former U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and many others. I believe that the Universal Peace Federation and its a broad set of partnerships in the realms of politics, religion, academia, media, economy, arts, women and youth serve as a good mother. I believe the Universal Peace Federation will become a cornerstone to build lasting peace around the world and a heavenly unified Korea based on interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values. Celebrating 15 years, UPF will continue to grow through service, dialogue and collaboration, guided by its spiritual and moral vision of one family under God.
inspiration is highly needed. It's important to take in consideration all aspects, including, we just heard it, the North Korean fears, and that nobody loses face. I don't believe one should be a winner and the other one should have lost the game. It's a question of finding a solution that both can be the winners. And during this time of the pandemic, we need health for peace and peace for health. The two laureates, Professor Dame Sarah Catherine Gilbert and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, are the heroes who devoted themselves to health for peace. Together, with wisdom, sincerity, and resolve, I do believe we can illuminate the path to peace both on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. A breakthrough of peace on the Korean Peninsula would reflect globally. If peace will be the cornerstone of every nation and every generation, then the 38th parallel can become a symbol of peace rather than division. We are doing a great job making any effort to unify Korea, but uh, respecting human rights, uh, uh, having uh, uh, the sense of history that drives you to this uh, effort for unification. In this context, the Korean Peninsula could be the ground of an exemplary pathway to peace. I am sure that the Universal Peace Federation Summit will contribute to this important process of searching for constructive solutions to a conflict that has been going on for too long. The people of Kosovo and of South Korea share a similar past of suffering under occupation and of struggle for freedom. Freedom means and seeks peace. Sege Moden Naradari Hanadel Humoro Moshin and Jari Samani Jinjangan Sege Pyonga Chayo 평등, 평화, 통일의 행복한 하늘 부모님을 중심한 인류 한 가족의 세계가 이루어질 수 있습니다.
It's so nice to see everyone, so many different backgrounds, races, religions, all together in one room. That's amazing. And ages, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of us are adding to one extreme. <laughs> but uh, it's so great to see everyone, and it's so great to see everyone online as well. And uh, we've, we're very grateful that you've, you've tuned in from different countries around the world. And today, uh, that's very appropriate, because today we're going to commemorate the United Nations Day. Usually, United Nations Day is, well, it, officially it's on October 24th, but we have this event at the end of the month, of each month, so we decided to commemorate today. And we have two eminent speakers. Uh, we have Reverend Dr. David Hanna, who's here in, in the audience, together with us, who's come from, from Colchester. And also we have uh, Mrs. Caroline Hanshin, who's online uh, from Geneva, or close to Geneva. Who has a lot of experience with working with the United Nations and also uh, working with the, uh, women's rights uh, within the UN framework. So she has a, a lot of experience and we're looking forward to that. First, I, I wanted to, to ask uh, Reverend Dr. David Hanna to, to, to come and speak. And uh, he could, could uh, set us going for this evening. Reverend uh, David Hanna, he's the uh, UPF president for, for Northern Europe. And he's a, a longtime friend, and uh, sometimes we have a, a one-day seminar or a weekend in uh, in Wiltshire, and it's often uh, David who is is giving those those talks and explaining the principles behind Universal Peace Federation, the reasons why we can can all work together, different races, religions, this idea of one humanity being one family. Uh, so David sets down the philosophical uh, background to that. So time we'd like to, to welcome him <laughs> to give the opening presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin, and good evening, everybody. Good evening. I really feel I'm amongst friends here, but uh, formally I say good evening, ambassadors for peace and uh, peace associates of uh, very important nature. So thank you so much. Um, we are considering the uh, United Nations Day and renewal of the United Nations in today's uh, monthly program. So uh, UPF and uh, indeed our founders, Dr. and Mrs. Moon, they are really strong supporters of the United Nations. And in particular, I would say, of its founding vision. So really feeling that the move that countries felt to make after the First World War with the League of Nations and after the Second World War with the United Nations was very much, you know, the hand of God at work to bring us, you know, out of, we hoped, right, an era of conflict uh, into a new era of great cooperation and crossing uh, national borders to work together. So, and as you know, UPF now uh, enjoys general consultative status at the Economic and Social Council of the UN, or ECOSOC. And I was reminded in the invitation that you received uh, and I received today that actually uh, there are only 140 NGOs with that status. So uh, it's quite something for a relatively young organization to have achieved that. So uh, I'd like tonight to refer you back to our founders' words on this topic so we can set some kind of groundwork there. Um, and I absolutely give way and greatest respect to our next speaker, Mrs. 
Carolyn Hanshin because she's really doing the work. She works with the United Nations and uh, has done some uh, immense kind of pioneer work to uh, further um, the, the work of the movement generally, you know, to, to make this relationship there in Geneva. So uh, that you will hear the kind of genuine stuff, but I'm a little bit of a just preparing the way, I think, tonight, right? <laughs> which is uh, not a bad thing to position to be in. So, um, you know, we are, we are here to consider United Nations renewal and develop our own kind of active interest in its successful future. So, some years uh, before the founding of UPF, Father Moon gave an address at the United Nations headquarters in New York. And I quote from his speech there, he said, conflicts arise for many reasons, but one of the primary factors contributing to their emergence is the deep-rooted disharmony that exists among the world's religions. Therefore, when we witness the many global tragedies occurring around us, we should recognize how critically important it is that religions come together, dialogue with one another, and learn to embrace one another. Hear, hear, hear indeed. So references to faith and religious ideals in the early drafts of the United Nations Charter and documents were excluded, as you probably know, in order to allow important players driven by strong atheistic and materialistic ideologies to join around the table. So it was somehow a precondition for that. And at that time, that was the necessary thing to do and was probably the only thing to do to ensure that there was that level of cooperation. So in a later speech, also at the United Nations, uh, Father Moon said, we are meeting in the United Nations, the United Nations building, which was established as a temple of peace. And I thought, well, that's an interesting word, right? I don't know if they've called themselves that before, right? A temple of peace. But I felt it was really just to give more of kind of God's perspective on this. Uh, institution and organization. And he said, we must do everything we can to support the United Nations so that it can be a true instrument of peace that fulfills its founding vision. So UPF is still contributing to that and you're doing so tonight by, by being here. I think um, maybe on that occasion or close to that occasion, Father and Mother Moon also held a marriage blessing ceremony. And if Raymond, you could give the, he's done it already. <laughs> he's so intuitive, right? This, this is actually inside the United Nations building in New York, and it's a marriage blessing ceremony. You, you know, Father and Mother Moon are famous for this, right? But what you'd normally expect to see is, you know, brides in white dresses, men usually in blue or dark suits and red tie and white shirt and, you know, for their wedding day. You don't see it here. Why? Because actually, especially at that time in the United Nations uh, buildings, you could not hold any religious ceremony of any sort, right? So, you know, what was uh, the great man's wisdom? It was to say, okay, everybody come in your national costumes, right? <laughs> so that's what you see here. One or two wedding dresses slipped in because, uh, I don't know, maybe like me, you know, uh, one advantage of being an Englishman is you don't have a national costume. So, uh, you know, I'm always grateful for that. <laughs> I don't know what it would be. Um, but, you know, I don't think there is. So... Uh, those, those individuals, you know, chose their white dresses, their wedding dresses. They, they slipped in there. But otherwise, you know, this was the scene, and it was very fitting, right, for the United Nations to have those couples uh, following this ideal that, uh, as we say, our true parents, or Father and Mother Moon, are really um, 
so devoted to and uh, always uh, promoting, that is international and intercultural uh, marriage blessing, right, to bring people together across, you know, what sometimes are uh, serious barriers, but this is uh, a very fitting twist to it, I would say, right? So, um, the fact is that most nations, in most nations, you know, religious ideals have come to hold a place that's wholly separate from the centers of secular political power. Uh, we have that in, in our country here almost, right? And most people have come to accept this reality as the way that things ought to be. Uh, for example, to introduce a bit of a personal note, uh, tomorrow is... Uh, uh, my youngest son is having his civil wedding. He had his blessing in one of these ceremonies, right, some years ago. Um, but this is to get their marriage certificate, and uh, it's in a registry office in central London. Uh, when you apply for that, I don't know if any, any of you know the system, but when you apply for your uh, ceremony in such a registry office, Couples are told, you can choose any inspirational quotes or readings that you like as part of your ceremony, as long as it's not religious. And if it is, they have to stop the ceremony. Did you know that? So, you know, I can't help but think, you know, we've got ourselves into a bind in this country, you know? I don't think it was ever meant to be that, right? Uh, especially, I know, you know, who's coming to this wedding tomorrow. <laughs> 20 family members, they'd all be so happy to have some inspirational religious quote, but they're not allowed to. Hmm, curious, isn't it? <laughs> so, so uh, Father Moon was very sure that it's time now to uh, have international organizations whose purposes to support this ideal of world peace, really reconsider their relationship with the great religious, religious traditions of the world. So in the United Nations building, he made a, a public call for UN renewal. And if I can have this slide, he says here, world peace can be fully accomplished only when the wisdom and efforts of the world's religious leaders work cooperatively and respectfully with national leaders. Serious consideration should be given to forming a religious assembly or council of religious representatives within the structure of the United Nations. And indeed, you know, that uh, process was taken, or that proposal was taken seriously and the process got underway with 49 sponsoring nations for this proposal, spearheaded by the Philippines, and interestingly, when you look at the list of those 49 nations, they are ones with very diverse religious cultures, such as Pakistan, the Russian Federation, Thailand, you know. Um, this led to the setting up of a focal unit to aid dialogue. That's the kind of uh, UN language. And that was in December 2007 with a, uh, a meeting which was a high-level dialogue in interreligious understanding and cooperation for peace. And then progressed a series of such high-level dialogues and uh, you know, discussions to further this kind of idea and bring this perspective into the realm of the United Nations. His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, the eighth Secretary General of the UN, Quite a number of people say, is he related to Reverend Moon? <laughs> but no, actually, his family name is Ban. That's the Korean style, Ban Ki-moon. Uh, so Reverend Moon would be uh, Moon Sun Young, actually, in the Korean style. So it's, it just happens to have the same sound to that uh, Korean character. But anyhow, of course, he is you know, very closely working with us with Think Tank 2022 right now, and uh, it's very good to have his support. Um, he served in that role as Secretary General uh, between 2007 and 2016, and in this slide, there's a quotation from Ban Ki-moon. He said, it is time to promote the idea that diversity is a virtue, 
not a threat. It's time to explain that different religions, belief systems, and cultural backgrounds are essential to the richness of the human experience. And it's time to stress that our common humanity is greater, far greater, than our outward differences. Having, having come across this quotation, I thought, if that were read out at a British civil wedding ceremony, <laughs> would it be considered as too religious? <laughs> so I think I'll reserve it for the dinner afterwards and uh, <laughs> we're free, free to share whatever we want. So, um, you know, my son has British Korean parents and his spouse has uh, uh, Japanese French parents who live in Germany, so, you know, we're doing quite well on that intercultural <laughs> effort at least, right? So, finally, it's interesting to note um, what was uh, being called for in terms of UN renewal. Um, often it's, I hear it referred to as like an upper house of the United Nations. That sounds probably like too big a constitutional leap for it to be in any way viable, just to introduce a whole another, uh, another house. Um, well, it may have the spiritual importance, I would say, of an upper house and kind of function in that way. But this is how the proposal was phrased, that it would be a UN interreligious council, possibly having, and this is a kind of beginning suggestion, uh, as part of the dialogue, 40 councillors representing major and on a rotating basis smaller religions, as well as what it called spiritual eminent persons. Well, that's all of you for start, right? Spiritual eminent persons. And they would serve possibly a three year term and then change. So it's not a kind of rigid theocracy level of kind of government right in there. It's, you know, a very flexible, very uh, um, fluid in that way. And uh, I'm sure could contribute a great deal to have that input of, you know, the centuries, millennia even, of uh, wisdom of the world's religions represented and uh, l really increasing the level of uh, conscience. Father Moon saw the United Nations, and in his terminology, it was always like a, a body without a mind. Right? <laughs> it sounds a little crude, but, you know, uh, to make it much more versatile and much more responsive and conscious-driven, this was his aim of giving it um, this council, interreligious council, and seeing that have a very, very noble function within the whole um, structure. And as the Roman poet Juvenal put it, mens sana in corpore sano, which was, you know, long before it was hijacked by the sporting uh, fraternity, meaning a sound mind in a healthy body. And I think that is what he wanted to see in terms of the United Nations, so it could continue to evolve and develop and have a really essential peace-making function in the world at large. Uh, Reverend Moon did not expect, I think, change in the UN structure to come about necessarily anytime soon, right? To uh, change those things. So, given that, what did he do? He founded the Universal Peace Federation, right? Not as a rival, but as kind of saying, well, until you get that sorted out, let's, let's show you, you know, what it can do, right? Which is very wise, isn't it? It's like a, a plan B, but a very good plan B, right? So uh, uh, that that's, was his strategy, and that led to the founding of the Universal Peace Federation and to your being here tonight. So I want to say thank you again uh, for coming, and thank you for listening to me. God bless you. Thank you very much, David. We now have the, the pleasure of, 
of inviting Mrs. Carolyn Hanchin to speak. She's online, I'm very close to Geneva. Hello, Carolyn. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Carolyn has many years of experience of working with the UN in Geneva, and particularly for women's, women's rights and promotion of women's role within the UN system and, and beyond. And she's been recognized for this, this work and received a, a new position uh, with, I think, you, I'm sorry, my notes aren't in front of me, but you'll have to, to explain uh, in accurately your, your position. But I think uh, it really recognizes a long period of, of work in Geneva with, with a women's committee that, there and uh, shows her experience also with, uh, in working with the United Nations. So I'd like to also uh, uh, hand over, so she will be giving an explanation of the Women's Federation for World Peace, our uh, affiliated organization from the same founders and their work with, with the United Nations, which is uh, preceded UN, uh, UPF by a, at least 10 or 11 years. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Please welcome Mrs. Karen Henshaw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, to Robin. Thank you to UPF. Thank you. I, I wish I could see the audience. I can't. I wish I could see who I was talking to, but I'll just imagine it's like some of those photos that you had on your the previous video that showed. And I'm sure I know some of you in the audience, if not many of you. So Tonight, we, we were talking about renewing the United Nations, which actually is something I'm thinking about all the time and uh, working on with uh, my team also all the time. Uh, one thing, since, since I first started going to the United Nations uh, back in 1994, yes, long time ago, uh, I always had this idea clear, clearly in my mind, that the United Nations is God's idea. And that I felt I was going there to somehow, somehow hold on to that and make that more obvious to people. And I, I always kept it really in my heart and in my mind. If we want to talk about like renewing the United Nations, which as you heard from David, David, by the way, I could just erase about a third of my speech here, actually, while you were speaking, because you said many things that I thought I might have to say, but um, but thank you for what you did say. And, uh, you know, at the time of the founding of the United Nations, of course, after this long process with the League of Nations, and of course, which we have in Geneva, tribute to that, um, we know that the... the, the uh, the United Nations really came out of this trauma from the world wars. We, we can't hardly imagine it, but you know, a series of wars in 30 or so years that affected you know, life like incredibly and so much. And uh, so it's like the world, at least especially our part of the world was really traumatized. So the United Nations started with that. And if I even just look simply at some of the a couple of the phrases from the uh, um, from the preamble of the UN Charter. Uh, we, the peoples of the United Nations, determine to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. And of course, then about a reaffirming faith in fundamental human rights and dignity, which of course was completely damaged through all of this combat. And, uh, and then all goes on to say also to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. So we can see that it was really, really heavily on this side of the role of the government, the role of people who seemed rather far away from most of us uh, or those living at that time and making decisions at that time. But somehow this, uh, this body was sort of being put in their hands. If I have to say just in a sentence or two, what I think 
renewal of the United Nations is all about. I would say it is becoming a body where the people own, own it, the ownership of the people, by the people. And this is something that I remember Kofi Annan used to talk about a lot. And I thought this was, this was really, really true. Opening up more to civil society. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as David explained about UPF, uh, Women's Federation too. Actually, even if we want to be a little bit competitive, Women's Federation got our general consultative status from our first report that we sent in back in 1997, actually, uh, because of this breadth of, um, uh, you know, a presence that we had in 150 countries and because of some quite amazing events that we made at the Beijing conference in China. So we sort of came out of nowhere with this huge presence and you know, had also speakers. We had Maureen Reagan and uh, anyway, it was quite a, anyway, the UN looked at, looked at us and gave us immediately that, that status. But um, just maybe to mix a little bit with some, some experiences of mine, I just last week, I was at a conference on transnational organized crime in Vienna, the UNTOC. And we had a, the Women's Federation, we had an event there, which we often do at these intergovernmental events. And then we, we are present also in teams where we are looking to, to interact with the governments and different and different experts and really bringing in our different points about family, uh, about the role of women, the importance of women's leadership, uh, many, you know, use, it's, it's also not, a, not at all just about women. I have to say, Women's Federation is not just about women. Women's Federation is about working with women for the sake of the world. And that is maybe one point that separates us sometimes from some other women's organizations who are very often focused on themselves, on women. And, and of course that needs to be done too, but ours, our Women's Federation is a much broader, you know, a broad, much broader platform, always thinking for the sake of the, our families, for the sake of communities, for the sake of a better United Nations and intergovernmental cooperation, we are there to encourage that. So um, the event that the Women's Federation had at this imagine a uh, transnational organized uh, crime event, which sounds sort of a little out of the league of NGOs that do a lot of, we do a lot of local activities, you know, since our founding in 1992, we continue incredibly successful local activities in still between about 122 nations, in fact. So, so what we have, uh, discovered and what was what we were reminded about last week again at this event was that governments are getting more and more desperate actually more and more desperate not understanding what to do about some of these global problems so also we can talk about transnational trade in many different ways but in reality even transnational trade comes down to individuals families, individuals who have an ethical sense of responsibility, families that are healthy, communities that are flourishing. But many of these kind of uh, discussions were not in these events in the past. So we come in to remind governments that actually it comes back to us locally and we have to listen to each other in order to really find the solution. You have to listen to us. In fact, we don't even say it like that because that's not the way we work in Women's Federation. We say, we want to listen to you, and then we want to talk with you about how we can work together, maybe to do it better, which again is maybe a little bit different than some other NGOs sometimes who have the style of a little bit pushing the governments into the corner. We're trying, like, uh, of course, UPF is, is similar in that way too, but, um, the event that we held actually at the at this uh, at this uh, uh, at this conference last week was called the title was preventing crime through encouraging healthy lifestyle for young people. 
So even this big, huge debate, intergovernmental debate, comes back to that. And actually, we find governments that are very much interested and very much listening when we come in with some of these ideas. And of course, we had the, the government of Costa Rica, the ambassador of Costa Rica, whom we know has, uh, which, which has, you know, abandoned the idea of needing military. And, um, and uh, so really they have had many years to really think about alternatives. And he, this, this particular ambassador whom I knew from Geneva actually brings in this, uh, this important point about family, the role of family in solving crime, in peace building, in of course, creating good communities. Um, but we also, uh, of course, uh, we, work a lot, we work with uh, the Millennium Development Goals in the past, Kofi Annan's baby, they said. <laughs> and now currently, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are goals that, um, uh, again, the UN has done an amazing job in, um, in writing these up. I would say even better, the Sustainable Development Goals, which had more so had more input from civil society. The MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, we, we heard, we know that actually was done rather quickly and mostly just the experts getting together to write this. Nevertheless, they also had quite an impact. But this is, uh, this, these sustainable, these development goals are, I would say the UN's new face of really wanting to uh, provide opportunities for civil society also big emphasis on youth, which was not there in the, even in the rather recent past, but now there are many, many even departments and focal points and many things to really try to seriously bring youth into not only the discussion and not only the preparations, but actually into the problem solving. So, and of course our current, even Ban Ki-moon, Antonio Guterres, um, they, they continue of course in this this area of youth involvement, and of course, the importance of the SDGs. Um, so Women's Federation in that way, of course, in since 2000, when the MDGs were first announced, we immediately jumped on that in all of our programs, in all of our 150 countries, they all focused on different aspects of the MDGs. So we really developed kind of a, a platform of, uh, you know, our, the whole, um, the whole uh, kind of outlook or perspective of our work would, could be fit within that framework of the development goals. So now, years later, many years later, of course, we have an amazing collection of local solutions to problems working with the SDGs. And I would say that is my job at the United Nations as director of the United Nations Office of the Women's Federation, and even my job as president of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women, as, Dave, uh, as, as Robin mentioned, uh, my job is our job also as N NGOs is to bring in these solutions to the governments who are making decisions, often very theoretical decisions, and really helping them to understand actually if these, these recommendations and these ideas and decisions are actually going to work locally or not. So we become like the mediator at the United Nations. Um, of course, as David, David mentioned that uh, uh, Father Moon was very, talked much about the renewal of the United Nations and had quite some strong ideas, which I think also are being, are being um, you know, followed up and taken up by many others. I wanted to share one experience um, in the year 2012, so that's 20 years after Women's Federation was founded. Um, our, the founders, Dr. And Dr. Moon and her, his wife, Dr. Moon, uh, Hak Jahan Moon, they invited women, all the women from our, uh, our Women's Federation and from actually all of our different departments to come to, um, to Korea and to sort of sit with them and listen to a new direction that we should receive at that point. So that's 20, uh, that's uh, 2012, so that's 10 years ago. And um, 
during that time, it was it was so amazing. I mean, I actually, I amazingly had the opportunity to go up on stage. There were tens of thousands of people in the audience to go up on stage and to make kind of an introdu- introductory presentation about the Women's Federation with very little notice, little warning ahead of time. But um, but it was quite uh, uh, so so uh, what whom we call Father and Mother Moon they. They sat the women in the audience in teams of two. And I can remember so clearly how this looked from the stage, especially two, like two delegates, like at the United Nations, sitting in small tables, two two women together next to each other. We had these banners on, you know, like we were represent, we represented our nations, actually. And then um, and then after that, Father Moon got up and he he spoke to all of us about. Uh, he said some very interesting things. He said, one thing he said, I'll never forget was, um, he explained to us, of course, the role and responsibility. So the goal of the Women's Federation is to be a global peace movement, he said. It's not a political or aggressive movement, but nevertheless, to influence politics from, from the side. And he, he said to us also, looking into the audience, he said, why are some of you hiding in your basements? And we all kind of we all kind of smiled and looked around at each other. He said, "How can you expect families centered on true love if you're not really out there showing how you live and how you work?" And he, it was really an amazing like 45 minute speech where he talked it to us like he was talking just across the table to us, but there were these tens of thousands of people. And um I think for me, in my own mission, working with Women's Federation at the United Nations, I look back to this speech every time. I have so many PowerPoints about this because that was the time when he said, we we have, and of course he and he and Mrs. Moon, Dr. Moon prepared this speech together, but it's like at the last minute, he asked if he asked if he could get up and make the speech instead of her. And uh, so, he, um, uh, you know, he said to us, well, uh, now is the time when you have to, first of all, he said, women must be able to advance beyond men's power. If anyone thought Father Moon was a, you know, some kind of a woman hating patriarch, uh, it, there never could be further from the truth. He said, um, he, I mean, I'm just going down here. He said the role of the Women's Federation at this time is to unite women around the world and to provide a, a platform for mobilization, working together with civil society organizations, especially women's organizations, who have a like-minded kind of thinking and with the position to uh, influence governance. Because he said, and we heard, we all heard this many times, he said, Governments cannot do it. Even the United Nations itself was founded, was began, he said, um, w- disabled because there was too much political play in there. It was never meant to be that kind of beginning of that, of that organization. It should have really been governments for world peace, not governments in defense of themselves and against each other which is of course what we still find at the United Nations. But so basically he's told us that we, we have to become great leaders who em, emulate what we're, what we're trying to do. And we have to really go out and bring women together to defend um, things like uh, ethical priorities, defend family, uh, also even defend faith and, um, and really work hard together to, to really solve world problems. And he spoke several times also about values education and the importance of really making sure this ed- education side, the side of education was really, um, you know, infiltrated in, in education around the world, in fact. And that is, that is the only way that we will have future leaders actually who can also be the leaders that we need. Um, so maybe I just jump forward now to, to now. And this, I have, there's so much happening in our work at Women's Federation at the United Nations, and I know locally too, but, um, but just to say what is happening in the next week and a half, 
And maybe I told you about what happened last week in Vienna. So we have, um, you know, we have teams in New York, in Vienna and Geneva. And uh, I am the kind of the, the coordinator. I'm the director of all those offices. So we work together quite tightly. In Geneva, we have Human Rights Council. We have the, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And of course, as I said, I'm the head of this uh, Geneva Committee on the Status of Women, which means I work together with 20-something international women's organizations, very the most well-known, renowned women's, feder women's uh, organizations, you know, who are also present in New York and Vienna. And um, we have working groups in our committee on environment, development, youth, advocacy. We have publications. We have many, many things on. We, we have planned a breakfast briefing, a series of breakfast briefings with ambassadors over the next few months, leading up to uh, the Commission on the Status of Women in March. We have just so many, many things going on. But what I, I have to say, I, am, I feel so grateful for my also my work in, in Europe with the Women's Federation until recently responsible for the work there that I have, I feel really blessed to have incredible team of people, of women to work with because uh, we can advance so quickly when you're working with people who are moving in the same direction. And I think from the beginning, I, actually, Robin, I'm not sure of the time, how, how I'm not sure if maybe should, I, I should wind down, I think. <laughs> but, um, you know, one thing I noticed working with um, at the United Nations and with strong women leaders and leaders of NGOs uh, and governments um, or representatives of governments that strong women leaders need also someone to liaise between them, to keep peace among them. And this was something that actually I maybe, maybe I had less experience starting out, of course, back in the 90s. Um, but I think I was quite good in bringing the women together and in really helping to facilitate peaceful environment so that we could actually go on to do important things and be present in important places. And um, one of the things that we, we try to do also is uh, reminding governments of their responsibilities. And in order to do that, as I said, coming up, actually even yesterday, we had an event where we, we were, um, it was a training session working with one of my young assistants, Shruti Leka, a young Indian girl. It was a training on working with the right to development. You know, the way to move governments, of course, we can't just talk, in order to, to move something, you have to understand how the other is thinking. So we have to understand what commitments the governments have made. And the commitments are not just, you know, reading the sustainable development goals, but there are all kinds of other covenants and recommendations and resolutions. And in order, if we want to seriously work with governments, we have to understand these things. We have to understand how governments think and what things they are taking into consideration when they are fulfilling or not fulfilling their responsibilities. So we make many trainings. We had one yesterday, even next week, we have 15 young people coming from four continents to, be to attend sessions at the Human Rights Council, but also to in between be trained on all these covenants and all these behind the scenes kind of thinking that governments have, which we have to, we can't just come plowing in with our, you know, our issues, that, that the way it looks to us at home, but we have to really find the way to really listen to the governments and think like they do, and then come towards them with our, you know, offering our support to help them do their job and winning their trust so they, in fact, want to listen to us and understand how important partners we are. So um, we have... Since I, Robin, I couldn't hear anything from you about my time, and I'm sorry I didn't check my time, but maybe I just make one more point about this. And um, 
you know, we have we have many, many programs. We have currently, we have uh, even going on now, a three-month human rights internship program for young women. And in the past five, eight years, we're always inviting men, young men too. So no, no longer just women, women and men. And uh, we have this program where uh, we send out invitations. We we you know we we look through to see, see who's um, who who kind of fits that particular human rights internship. Oftentimes they're master students or end of university, and we give them the opportunity to tell us about their most passionate sort of injustice that they see. Usually it's at, in their home, in their community, in their country somewhere. And then we help them to write advocative papers with recommendations to governments on those issues. So meaning like a 4,000 word paper, real, real, you know, academic papers, but with that kind of style that is meant to really bring change. And then we provide them a, plat them a platform to be able to present their papers and we invite some experts to listen. And then of course they go home, uh, actually in this case is virtual. So they're, they're at home and then they take this work to, to really try to influence the situation in their, in their nations. And we had, we had now, a, we've had three series of these and it's really been exciting also for us, Shruti and myself to really work with these young women and men and to see how excited and how brilliant they are and how many good ideas they have and kind of help to a little bit mold them. I mean, encourage them in a way so that they do it so that the governments will really listen. You know, you have to, of course, you have to be not overly enthusiastic and you have to, you know, have to, again, understand the situation of the government. So, so anyway, we have so many things happening. We had recently, this is a little bit further back, a few months ago, we had the uh, this program with um, uh, peace, uh, youth peace uh, conferences, a series. Every year we have one. Last year we had one where we got youth together from around the world, about 18 youth, plus a few youth from um, uh, Palestine and a few youth from Israel. And we brought them together to simulate a peace building commission. And we, again, we, I, intergenerational, but the, the, the seniors were always in the background, you know, so it was kind of softly nudging the process. And, uh, and then they came up with a um, incredible peace accord that actually came to some kind of agreement, unlike the governments were able to do. So, with, but really not easily, really with great seriousness, we all thought it couldn't happen. It was over two days, like almost nonstop two days and preparations for three weeks. And then this year we tried it again with Korea, with uh, North South Korea. Uh, problem was we had difficulty finding North Koreans, as you could imagine. So we had South Korean youth, youth from the rest of the world who came in representing America and Pakistan and different places. But from North Korea, we had to bring someone who just played the role. And uh, anyway, it was an amazing process. So maybe my closing thought then is that um, um, renew, about re, re, renewing the United Nations is it really comes down actually to renewing ourselves, I would say, that we have to, uh, we have to find a way to make ourselves sense our importance in the global interaction. I know, I mean, this is this is the way UPF works too. This on this point, Women's Federation and UPF were were very similar. We have to encourage uh, you know, people at every level to really be interested, like about the work of the United Nations, because it's so inspiring and exciting, but it can never work without the support of the local, of the local communities. If we cannot bring back you know, bring the successes from the local to the UN and bring the UN's decisions that were based on their successes back to the local, uh, you know, then that that is cut and that that is really that is really a big shame. So but the, the very last thought is in um, just last week when I was in Vienna, we heard from uh, some of the governments that um, sorry to say, but if we do not, if the civil society really has to insist, in other words, 
governments are there doing their job. They're not always reaching out and asking for help from civil society. So sort of the burdens on our shoulders. If we want to make these partnerships, we have to reach out and do it. We have to do it in a wise way, knowing their commitments, their burdens, their responsibilities, but showing our, you know, what we have to offer. So thank you very much for this chance to speak about my favorite topic. Huh? And <laughs> thank you, Robin. Thank you, thank, thank you, you Carolyn. Carolyn. <laughs> Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. I, I wanted, wanted to, 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 open to open the, open the, the floor, 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 both online, online and, and here in the here audience. audience. If, if, first, of first of all, if you have any questions, questions for Carolyn, Carolyn, then we, then we can allow, allow her to her leave, to because, leave I know, because I know she has a very busy, busy schedule. schedule. I'm, I'm very grateful, very grateful for, her for her time. time. Does, anyone Does anyone have any questions, questions first of all, for Carolyn? For Carolyn? Alan? Alan? Oh, I oh, think you'd I have, think to, come have to come up and, and we need a we microphone. Need a microphone. Yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you bring, can you bring a, microphone? a microphone? Then maybe, maybe if you, could you could face that, face that camera, that camera, camera at the back. The back. It's, it's okay. I'd you like could, to could, face could, the lady. No, actually, no, actually you're no, facing, you're facing the lady by facing that camera at the back. All right, all right. Where okay, come up, up, here, up here. Yeah. Where, 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 where I am. Where I am. All, right, all, right. all right. First of all, thank you so much. Maybe you, you need to turn around, around. around. And, and then and speak. You make up your mind. Where should I? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the, your dedication and devotion for the cause of UN as well as a global peace at some time, hopefully. And the most unfortunate thing, I'm going to just point out a couple of things and get into the most important topic for me. Unfortunately, UN, with all its successes, if we count them, failed to reach to the heart of the MENA region people, to the Middle East. East and North Africa, and you, and you know exactly, exactly what, what, what what's, what's the problem the there. But now, but now I think, in my view, that, that as, as women, women, as women, women we, can we can create that, that change. change. And that, and that, will, that, that won't come without the support and help of influential bodies but like you, like UBF and, and Women, Women for Peace and so on. So uh, I have been working for the past 10 years on uh, universal women rights, basically connecting with the Middle East and based on equality and justice for women. We need, we are living in a global village at this time of our lives. And the only way to to, uh, let's say, limit or contain conflicts is through women. Women are the key, are the key for bringing humanity to the conscience of everybody. And we have reached a stage in our lives. I don't want this situation we are facing for my children or yours or my grandchildren, everybody, everybody, regardless where they are. So I believe that women voices now are so important to be globalized and calling and put certain uh, principles for this justice and equality, regardless which part of the world, which faith, we have to go beyond faith. With all respect to people with faith or without, or without, we are all human. I always emphasize on our common humanity and this is the only way you can really turn the table and win the hearts of women where we can create a change. We need, we need to reach to every single person in, 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 in North Korea, Africa, Middle East, Israel, Palestine, everywhere because we have been suffocated as women for the past God knows how many years and I am truly truly we have been suffocated because 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 as a woman as a woman be, being in any kind of negotiation and discussion about this I will sacrifice my eyes so that my son or grand, my husband my brother my son is not hurt. It's time, and I don't call for women to be empowered 
only for this thing. I want to empower women for global justice for everybody. Uh, the, the most important thing as Could well you recently. Your, your group. Pardon? You're the founder of Basira. I am a founder of a, a, a small NGO called Basira for Universal Women Rights. Uh, at the moment, I'm targeting uh, the MENA region in particular. But what, what shocked me, a, a, a couple of months ago, uh, we had a one representative, government representative, who liaised between now and the, the, the National Alliance for Women Organization and the government. And I asked him, for God's sake, don't you think it's about time to have global educational values? You know, to teach our children, to, 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 to all we, of this. And he said, we never thought about the global values. As, it's time. It is women like you, like you, and like every woman here, to dare to stand up and say, enough is enough. But at the same time, I can't do it without the support of you, and you, and you, and every man. It is the only way for our global security. Um, and we, I count on you. Let Carolyn respond. Yes, please. Thank you so much for listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just yeah. I'll let, I'll let, I'll let him respond. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you because that is exactly the like-minded <laughs> kind of NGO that you know that we are working with and really want to continue to work with more more deeply and um you know with this emphasis on values and education and um but concerning women in the middle east of course i cannot couldn't talk about everything but in fact this is one of our i would say our most important and successful signature campaigns of the women's federation is the series of women's conferences on peace in the Middle East. And we have since the year 1997 or eight, I think every year, we have made a major conference, I mean, until COVID came, a major conference where we invited women from the Middle East, like every country, almost every country, maybe two women from each country, you know, 18, 19 countries, uh, uh, 40, 50 women who come to out maybe to Cyprus or to Turkey one time or to Greece or to Geneva, to the United Nations several times, Vienna to the United Nations. And we, we brought all these women together to really talk about different, uh, different issues that they were facing in the Middle East and North Africa. And it was really, I mean, it was really an it, it is a really an incredible program, and we see actually over these many years that it is there is something that has been built up, and now these women, some of them older women who came at the beginning, they're sending their young women, they're sending their daughters, they're sending other people to these events, and we're building up a whole kind of different kind of intergenerational network, and uh, of course it's been hard to sort of penetrate the, the, the Middle East. And that's why we had, you know, we had this, um, um, this idea. In fact, we went from the, the Women's Federation who went out to these different countries, um, they, they found that was the only way to really be able to work at the beginning was to bring the, to bring the women leaders out of their nations to meet somewhere like the United Nations Geneva and work on all the different issues that they were trying to solve. And we talked about Syria, we talked about Palestine. Uh, we made, you know, many kind of declarations and letters to the president of the Security Council, which we delivered by hand. Um, you know, so many, many, many things over many years. And I hope, maybe, I hope we can continue this conversation that you, you, just, you, you brought up. There's an echo. Maybe it's me. <laughs> 
Also, I think it's better. You, you might notice I just invited someone in here. Did, hello, Hannah. Uh, I know hello. it's here. Hello. <laughs> that is the, the secret to our success is that we work together with men, actually. And we love men and we love our husbands and our sons and our families. And uh, <laughs> So uh, that's the secret. Good partnerships. Yes. <laughs> but um, yes. Please come up here if you could stand there and, and speak. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, I am happy today. Introduce yourself. I am Khalid Asinger, defender from human rights and genocide from all the world, all Kurdish people, uh, and UPF ambassador. Nice to meet you this evening. And nice to hear uh, Miss Caroline about this news, and I call her to, uh, maybe ha she has knowledge about our girls in Syria, they fight in ISIS, and nowadays our Kurdish girls, uh, they are on the street, in the Iranian government, they uh, about girl uh, rights, I call all the women federation in the world to consider the situation, this civil society, not only for the women, for all the world, or for the whole Iranian people or Kurdish people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comment for Carolyn before I, I say goodbye Maybe to can her? I, can I just say something about that, Robin, huh? what okay. he said? Yeah, just that um, actually we are together with our um, committees on the status of women because this committee that I'm presiding over in Geneva, there's one in New York, there's one in Vienna, and there's one in Latin America and Africa. And we are actually in the next few days, in a week, I think, we're having an event on the women in Iran, actually. So maybe, Robin, I will send you the link for that and maybe you can you can send it out. but. I am so moved, actually, when I see these young Kurdish women in their military uniforms, you know, fighting for their rights and fighting for their countries and their families and their dignity. And it is so, just really so, so deep and so moving. And we, la actually, at the Human Rights Council, last, uh, I think, two times ago, we also made a statement. We work with young K Kurdish intern that I had, and we made a statement for the Human Rights Council about that situation. So uh, we can do something, uh, you know, it doesn't solve everything, but we can, we can bombard the Human Rights Council with, uh, with statements and with side events where we listen to some of these women who come and tell their story. And uh, so maybe we can talk about that later. And thank you very much for your... Um, actor Dinata is online. She has been campaigning for uh, Iranian women, I think, for some time. Mm. So there's a number of people um, who have expressed great concern about the situation in Iran and, and have been act very active on this, this issue. Within, I think within our kind of network of friends and supporters and uh, activists. Yeah. Uh, did, would yeah. you like anyway, to come up? I, maybe you? while she's coming up, I just want to say one more thing that we what we can't do is we can't think that there's nothing we can do because it's there, you know. And how do you how do you solve something like that? Because I think even awareness raising is very very important. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but could you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I don't know if you can see me. Uh, firstly, I really wanted to say thank you for your speech. It was really inspiring, really eye-opening, um, and really honored to be in your presence and hear what you have to say. Uh, so I work with faith communities mainly and young people in um, education. 
And one of the things that really caught my eye was what you were saying with um, working with young people across Europe and these different regions. And given that there's a network of youth organizations in the UK who are doing lots of podcasts, I was wondering what would be the best way to reach out to these other young people in the nations that you're referring to? Because I feel like it'd be really nice to collaborate with them potentially. Um, and I feel like you'd be in the best position to direct us. Um, so thank you once again, and also to the um, Universal Peace Federation as well. Thank you. Maybe Robin, you can you can send her uh, email address to me, or give her my email address. Okay, okay I will do. Thank you, um, Juliet. You want to say something? maybe? I think for Carolyn, I'll ask Juliet to speak, and then uh, after, yeah. You have uh, dinner Juliet waiting. Is... I heard. Huh? <laughs> Uh, good evening, and thank you so much, um, uh, Reverend um, uh, David Hanna, and of course, um, Mrs. Caroline Hanshin, um, and of course, this beautiful room um, of um, the um, Universal Peace Federation. My name is uh, Juliet Mahapila, and I love Margaret for introducing me to this. And so uh, I just want to uh, comment on a renewal of the UN. And one of the beautiful things that I feel would allow us to really um, renew this um, vibration of um, the UN is to enhance clean water around the world for every single woman because we are talking about women here today and sanitation. And I quote uh, Dr. Joseph Nyanchama, who reminded me that we're never um, in the middle of um, people to remind sanitation issues about women, because that is most important. And when a woman lacks great sanitation, what that tells us about in the world is we lack care and respect of a woman. I take this opportunity to thank this room because it is important for every girl child to be looked upon and for every single one of us, when there is, um, when you look at a child and you see a, a, warm, a, a girl in puberty and in some countries across Africa, some of them don't even have sanitary towels mm -hmm. and we continuously, and in places like Iran conflict and you know, you have this kind of desire. So I wanna celebrate with this room for bringing the consciousness and I want to thank every single man that takes opportunity to respect women. If we can do that, we will renew the rebirth of good, clean water for every family. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll give you the last chance to say something, Carolyn, and then we're going to, okay. I know your time is precious. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, maybe just responding to the last speaker. How true, actually. And, and this is an amazing, for me, this, this idea of renewing the United Nations, I would say this is, we see that happening in the fact that because civil society, in this case, mostly women's organizations, are coming forward to talk about these kind of sensitive issues, like, you know, sanitary uh, needs of young women, preventing them from going to, to school, and, uh, you know, or child brides. We have an event tomorrow, tomorrow actually in New York about child brides. And, but all these issues that actually governments didn't so easily talk about in the past and it was kept hidden. Uh, now because of civil society speaking out because of their concern and their growing confidence Actually, these issues can be talked about also in the highest levels of the intergovernmental kind of chambers. So I just say thank you to her for, for her work that she's doing. I'm sure she is working on that issue. So, and thank you very much for the chance to, to meet you tonight. And I'm sorry, I cannot see who I'm talking to, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sure sorry. it's a nice girl. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, anyway, Robin. Thank you, but we can see both of you. <laughs> so we'll we'll say goodbye. 
and thank you. And uh, we're very grateful for your, um, your message today and your account of your experience. And it's been very valuable. Thank you. Have a nice thank evening. You. Thank you. Thank you. I want to send you on, else have some questions or comments they want to make to, to David or they want to, to make uh, comments themselves? I'm Captain Javid, I, I mean, I saw your hand first. And then, <laughs> so maybe Captain Javid, would you like to come up and say something? And then maybe Sheikh, Sheikh Ramzi will... Good evening to all the ladies and the gentlemen and Honorable Robin Marsh and our elder brother and our mentor, Muhammad Walid Koker, MBE, and the Lady Margaret and all the staff. And all my old friend, there's a captain sitting here uh, from Pakistan. I salute for him also. This is, uh, it is an honor. It's a privilege for me, for my sons and my family and my friend to be the part of such an esteemed organization, Universal Foundation, which is a extended literally part of the United Nations. It is a renewal of the United Nations, and we are ready, we are appreciated, sir. Yes. Mm -hmm. We like the, all the humanitarian work and the social work and the medical work and all that, which is for the whole mankind. And the same, like uh, Mr. Moon, his, whatever his vision, origin was, mm. reunification of the, all the uh, North Korea and the South Korea and all the other countries. Why not we pray and we wish and we enhance and we do something for the Kashmir, for the Palestine, and for the uh, Kurdistan, and at the same time Turkish, Azerbaijan, and the, uh, the Armenia, and all of our European brothers, like Ukraine, and the Eastern Europe, Western Europe, all the conflicts, why not to solve it? And when it comes to the women, wonderful speech, wonderful day, we appreciate, we, it is our subject, my family and my wife especially, uh, to work for the women in the, and give them empowerment. But why not to, nobody talks, nobody thinks, about half a million pregnant women are trapped in the floods in Pakistan right now. And 33, 33 million people are displaced. They're standing, sitting on the river banks, all the floods. More than half a million, right? You know, they're all pregnant, no medical aid, no doctors, no midwives, no speeches, no lectures, nothing. I've been shouting, I've been speaking, I've been writing. Governments are doing something upon their own. So please sometimes raise voice for all the third world, for all the world, for all the known world, for all this material world at least. May God bless all. May God peace of the, uh, the, uh, the God peace be all of us, all of you, and all the humanity. We are all together. May God be with us. God bless you. I'm at the service. Me, my children, my sons, and my wife, which will be invited, she'll come. It is a privilege for me to be ambassador introduced by our senior brother, Mohammed Vulaid Koker, MBE, and Honorable Robin Marsh, and his wife, and the Margaret. And my, my children are ready, they are energetic, he's a journalist, he's a pilot, he's an engineer, robotics engineer, he's in the politics, Kashmir politics, Pakistan politics, world politics. Their mother is from England, and white woman, and revert to Muslims. But we are working for humanity. All of us. Thank you so much. Always at service. Our, our lines are open. Our emails is open. Our the telephone is open. Any question. But just remember, we are at the service. In the end, my honorable uh, first speaker, our chief guest, he talked about the uh, mixed races, Korea and the Japan and all that. I spent half of my life in the uh, Far East. I appreciate that in the mixed races and the mixed families and systems and all that. Yes. And I do appreciate, it is a time there are wars around the world. We appreciate the same problem is there for the last uh, 70, about 70 years about the Korea, they're all again on the brink of the war. 
one of the biggest slogan of the war and the Korean language was Arirang, Arirang, Arari Oa. I, I, I again recite that, I again say that. We work for the world, we work for the people, we work for the needy people, we work for the poor people, we work for the humanity, and we work for the Muslims as well. God bless all. Thank you. Sheikh Ramsey, could I just wait? Could, sorry. Um, I promised to someone else. Actually, I would like to hear from Congo. <laughs> yes. So, actually, we are, since we are people of the world and we have much of the world represented here, but many times we had events about Congo, particularly because of the suffering of Congolese people. And I mean, Charlotte Simon was, was up here very passionately. And now this um, young man also is, wants to really raise the issue of, of Congo. Could you introduce yourself yes. in your, your Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm so tall. <laughs> I have to excuse myself every time. So my name is uh, Donat Kanda um, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm very uh, delighted to be here. Uh, this is my second particip participation to the UPF. Uh, UPF is a, a correct platform where we can talk about uh, issues related to peace with like-minded people like us, because you know there are places where when you talk, for, you talk peace, uh, people will think that you are weak. Because, you know, because the, the, the easy way to solve something is to go and take guns and try to... But uh, I, I always say it's very easy to do war, but it's uh, very hard to make peace. And uh, I'm uh, very delighted also to meet uh, Madame uh, Charlotte from my country, who is also fighting for the right of women. I think the issue that uh, she's raising is very important regarding uh, women uh, violence against women, uh, where in Congo, the body of women now has been turned to uh, a gun. You know, it's like a, a way of, um, it's a systematic um, military uh, strategy. Uh, and all, with all the consequences, I think Madame Charlotte, uh, she's very appointed to talk about that better more than me. So I was um, asked by uh, Mr. Robin to talk about the uncomfortable, to raise the uncomfortable uh, questions about the UN. Uh, it's like the limitation of the UN, it's particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. First of all, I should recognize that the UN have did a great job around the world. The, the idea was, uh, as I said, the junior one uh, after the Second World War, uh, I think, uh, to have an organization where peace as the center to try to bring peace globally, it's very important because the first rights of human being is the right to live in peace. And Congo, we, we know how it is, um, we know what it feels like to lack that right because nothing can happen without uh, peace. You know, Europe has been reconstructed. I, I've been uh, several times in Europe because they achieve peace. Actually, there are some, uh, some problems, but after the Second World War, Europe have benefited from the peace, and it's become a big, big power, economic power, even challenging US, challenging other, other, other part of the world. But in Congo, if you want to understand what is going on, uh, uh, you have to also look at what happened in 1994 in Rwanda and genocide. Many of you knew about it. So the mistake that Congo did, I don't think it was a mistake, but uh, it was to accept to welcome two million refugees from Rwanda who were fleeing from uh, the genocide. But on that time, the government goes, we didn't, we didn't, on that time, we didn't have the UN uh, in Congo, missions in Congo. There was a MINUR in Rwanda. There was a mission, a UN in Rwanda on that time. But when the refugee cross and come in our, in our country, uh, there was, um, how can I say, they, 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 the UN didn't uh, really separate the military and the civilians. So in the two million refugees from Rwanda, unfortunately, there was a former army of, uh, of uh, Rwanda government who also flee and come to Congo with guns and all the, all the military uh, equipment. And they start posing some threat to the new government of Paul Kagame in Rwanda. But uh, the question is always to ask what, what, because in every war there is always what you call the economic dimension. 
So what you, when you look at in, in Rwanda, there was no interest in economic. Why, why the general salary? So you can see that Rwanda was just, uh, uh, how can I say, it was, uh, it was uh, a way to, well, to go to, to Congo because Congo, as all of you know, is very rich. So the economic dimension of what happened in Rwanda is in Congo. Uh, because of the natural resource. In some terms, you can see when the war of Congo starts, the invasion of Congo, we need to say it, by its neighbor, Rwanda, Uganda, and we have the first world war in, the, in, the, in the Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we have like something about 14 military army from Africa fighting, uh, comes with the exploitations of natural resource of, of Congo. So the, the, the UN fell in separating, because there was a turquoise operations. That was the UN missions on the border of Congo to uh, separate the civilian and the military who are fleeing from the Rwanda. The UN fell on doing that. And then we found ourselves uh, in these 20, now 20, more than 24 25. years, 25 years of war with our neighbors, uh, with, with also uh, rebellions, national rebellions. And the UN have, uh, in 1919, I think it was in 1919, the UN, the Council, the Security Council of UN decided to send the peacekeeping missions in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I think uh, it was the resolution 1279. Uh, we have like uh, actually 60 nations, 60 countries, part of that uh, peacekeeping mission. 19,000 uh, peacekeeper uh, soldiers from the UN. It costs two billion each year. That mission uh, costs two billion. But US dollars, US dollars. But after 24 years, the UN have not achieved peace. Because I think also the mistake of UN was they didn't explain to the population of Congo what was the mission about it. Because I think if they, because actually I talked to Robin before coming here, UN become very unpopular in Congo. Even me, uh, people from my own movement, sometimes they do challenge me. Like uh, we need to make a statement to ask for UN to, to leave Congo. I told them, no, we need to do the contrary because uh, there, there is a propaganda. I know where that propaganda is coming from. It's coming from our neighbors and from some corrupted uh, of our allies. Who, because I think the UN, have, uh, at least they didn't contribute in bringing peace in Congo. But their presence was also essential in uh, stopping, uh, you know, because I think we have like uh, 8 million um, people who died. I think if the UN was not there, maybe it would be the double. Because just the presence of UN keeps the, 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 the troops and the military and the uh, rebellions and other, other uh, foreign army that are operating in Congo to not uh, escalate it uh, on, the, on the what they're doing. Because uh, today now, that's what I, I, I always plead to the UN. Maybe we need to change the name of the, 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 the UN, the mandate, because the mandate was to bring peace, the stabilization in Congo. But actually, the role of UN is to help us organize election. So the, the, the mandate of UN was not to help for Congolese to hold elections. There are others organizations who can assist in the helping organizing election in, in, in any country in the world. So that's what uh, I think is uh, the weakness of uh, the UN. And the UN also assists us in all the peace talking that's happened in Congo since the Lusaka agreement until to the Sun City. Uh, but I think also, even in that process, UN also have made mistakes because uh, at the end, we, I, I told Rubin, I would talk about the failure of the diplomatic of peace, uh, of the, yeah, the, the diplomacy of peace. Uh, lay on that because we, we, we were negotiating with a proxy movement. The government of Congo, we have also, on that time the government was weak, it has not changed until today, on the fact that uh, we lack the culture of negotiations. Uh, we went to negotiate, it's like, can I can give an example, can, um, can, uh, uh, like, which example can I, I can give a, a current example? Can uh, Putin uh, negotiate? Uh, I don't know if uh, or like uh, can can Ukraine the president Zelensky can he negotiate with the Wagner? It's, it doesn't make sense. He can't negotiate with that. So in Congo they ask us to negotiate with things like Wagner, which are, we know that Wagner belong like Wagner is for for Russia, is it? So instead of talking directly to the Rwanda, in, instead of organizing. Dip, um, uh, diplo talk peace, diplomatic uh, meetings and conference with 
countries are involved uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the destabilization of Congo and the looting of the natural resources of Congo. We were negotiating with uh, Wagner, you know, like it's like Zelensky sitting table with uh, the CEO of Wagner negotiating peace. Because uh, we, but now the, it was like we are repeating the same mistakes because we are not touching the, 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 the root cause of the problem. And the UN on that also, he facilitates things like that instead of uh, making sure that uh, uh, we negotiate with people who are actually uh, uh, destabilizing the Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo. And uh, uh, there is, the, 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 the UN can, uh, as can still have to play a role in, in, in Congo uh, and also in Africa, I believe, in the, uh, in the UN, but uh, there is also the, like, how can I say, the nature of uh, the UN in terms of uh, deploying uh, peacekeeping missions. Because this all starts with the, the in, in 1945, after the, the Second World War, uh, it, was, the, the, it, it was established that they have to be, the UN have, should have its own military, uh, uh, its own military. I don't know how, that was the, the talk on that time. But it failed because because of the tension between the Soviet and uh, the, the American. So this, this is, didn't happen. I think if the UN can have its uh, own military, not depending on the nations, because I didn't want to go deep in what those 60 nations, which are actually part of the 19,000 peacekeeping soldiers in Congo, are involved in. Uh, they're also involved in, in, in rape. The involved in exploitations, yes, it's a UN report, is, is, is there to, 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 to talk about it. Because when you take soldiers from any country, some country, their army don't have any ethics, don't have any morals. Some of them are just uh, uh, super, superpositions of a guerrilla af that comes out of uh, some war and they become the national army. And when they are sent uh, all over the world to go to help UN maintain peace in some country, those people are, uh, in, instead of uh, doing their missions, they, uh, they get involved in, uh, in, um, in exploitation of natural resources, in um, uh, raping women and stuff like that. I think if the U, the, 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 there is a reform, we need to talk about the reform. This would be my conclusions. The UN have to reform itself. The, the mandate and the mission of the UN in Congo have also to be changed. Uh, and also, what, what I would say, like, uh, Broadly speaking about the continent of Africa, you know, Africa is actually destabilized, but we know where some of those will start. For instance, in the West Africa, we know it was uh, the collapse of the regime of uh, Mohamed Gaddafi, who bring instability and terrorism in all the West Africa, now it's going to the Central Africa. And Congo is a very strategic position, but we're now seeing the terrorists coming from the West Africa, and from also the Somalia, the, from the East Africa. And Congo is very rich. Who know what will happen the day where those terrorists will take over control of Congo? Because we have a weak government. We don't have any army. Our army is very weak. And those people have uh, more power. Like, I was sad to listen. The, I think I do respect Antonio Guterres is a good diplomat. But I think he make uh, mistakes, communication mistakes, when he spoke lastly during the, the UNGA, uh, saying that the M23, which is actually the rebel movement that is operating in Congo, and the army of Rwanda have more military capacity than the UN. So it's like you are telling the people of Congo, just, there's no chance, there's no chance. just uh, surrender yourself, give yourself to those people because we can't assist you. And the, this mission, going back to what happened to Libya, who authorized the, 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 the attack, the bombardment on Libya, it was a UN, uh, UN resolution led by France. Why? Because in Africa, on that time, the view was that this matter must be resolved in the diplomatic mean. And there was a, a mediator who was appointed, Thabo Mbeki, the uh, former president of South Africa, to, who, who, who went to negotiate. But in the time when Africa was trying to find a peaceful way to what was happening to Libya, there was a France who uh, convinced the council to, 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 
to take a resolution to, to go to solve uh, the situation of Libya through a military way. Why? Because in Africa, we didn't have veto. We don't have a veto right, and I will end by that. I'm saying we don't have a veto right. I think the reforms that have to happen in the UN, we need to allow Africa also to access to the veto, because we can protect our interests, because we know what is going on in our continent, but matters are decided by others, and we don't have any coercive mean of like a veto. I think it's a very important tool is that, 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 that veto. I think in the same way, the UN have managed to bring the, 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 the veto rights of uh, China from Taiwan to China. They did it from, for the Soviet Union to Russia. I think it's possible, even for, with the five uh, permanent seats, actually, to take the mandate of like, a country like France, the veto of France, to give it to one of African countries. Because Europe have like three vetoes. The United Kingdom have one. France have one. Russia is a European country, have one. And we know that after the Second World War, France was a, a liberated country. The mandate of France is an African mandate because France is a, we say France is an African military power. So I think uh, if Africa have that, it can prevent some of, uh, some of, uh, some of the violence that, that is happening. Thank you. So this is um, very interesting. Actually, Charlotte, we have someone to <laughs> to take over the passion from you. Uh, um, it's very very good to hear a, a new voice and um, the uh, the issue of Congolese human rights is one that we've spoken about many times here. And um, also we had events in Parliament and also European Parliament. Uh, and it's, it was said to be the worst, the, the east part of Congo was said to be the worst part of the world for, to be a woman uh, because of the gross kind of human rights issues there. It was like the Wild West where there was, there was no rule of law. And uh, too many war soldiers young sociopathic uh, soldiers who have been forced into war as young teenagers. So there was just multiplying trauma in that situation. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's got any better. Can I, I have to ask Sheikh, I'm sorry, I have to ask Sheikh Ramsey to, to come. I'm afraid we're going to need to finish because it's, it's after eight now. But, Margaret, I, you, you've been quite quiet tonight. What do you want me to say? Oh, did you want to come up? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Are you doing? Thank you. Very kind. Because I have to, when I say something, God bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May peace and blessing of, of Almighty God be upon you all. I just want to say one or two words, of course. I was going to make a comment on, on, on the Caroline says. I, I know her for a number of years. And, and of course, uh, her colleague, and, and David, and we have been many times in Geneva, in, in, in Korea, and uh, everywhere else, and talking for the woman and woman right. And she done, during, the, during the, that time, she's on, uh, you know, head of the uh, Women Federation. She's done a lot for the for the for the woman, and I take my hat off to her. What is of, of course happened there? Uh, um, as many many was asking, of course, one of the ladies was here asking, what can we do? What one thing I tell you, the first the first thing I got from the United Nations, the, the letter I was ten years old. A uh, ten years old, the first thing I got. Since that time, I'm with the United Nations. However, United Nations, unfortunately, unfortunately, with, because of the monies, they haven't got the brothers. Said, of course, military, military need the money. They haven't got the money. Americas or Russia or whatever, they stop, and, or unless they doing what they want. However, <clears throat> we are not going to political inside of it. They do, they do an excellent job. They renew an excellent job, and I take my hat to United Nations. I talk to the many of the member of the executive member of United Nations, including uh, Antonio Guterres. What I would like to say here is that there is a something which you can help. You can't help with the United Nations. You can help with the United Nations Association. 
is in the United Kingdom. And is we doing an excellent job. I'm one of the executive member, or maybe more sooner or later, God knows. However, but, uh, yes, uh, however, what I'm saying is a lot of things, lots of work we're doing. We're doing it on a climate change, we're doing it on a woman's rights, we're doing a basic woman rights, we, we, we're doing in the uh, uh, genocide, we're doing in the justice. Uh, you name it, we're helping the United Nations and need the people like you. And every city has the United Nations Association. And of course, I'm part of the headquarters here in India. But you, you, can, you can participate on that while you're participating, of course, in the UPF and everything else. It's a very important if you can participate on that and, and they put your, uh, put your uh, uh, um, proposal. They need you. They need your help. Uh, we got, I don't know, we got over a million uh, members or, or so, but we need your help. Everybody can help. And it is effective is a straight goes to headquarters and headquarters to, to United Nations itself. So then please, uh, if you want to do anything for the United Nations, uh, United Nations Association is there as well. God bless you all. Uh, is a very good if you could do while you are ambassador for the UPF because UPF doing an excellent job. I'm taking my hat. I'm one of the ambassador and so on, so on, so on. So, so I always come, no matter what David Hanna was saying a few minutes ago, how you make it? <laughs> Is that right or not? How you make it here and there and there and there and there? I said, well, if you have to do it for the sake of humanity, sake of justice, sake of brotherhood and sake of peace and justice, we have to, we have to at least do some work for it. God bless you all, and thank you for listening. That gorgeous lady coming up. Something wrong with my leg. <laughs> well. Put your hand together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought Robin was doing a very good job, so I didn't interfere. Uh, but if he says, why you're not saying anything, I should say something. I, I look at your faces, and I see United Nations here. And I feel that we, our own job is to bring people together. Now, for example, you saw Caroline, and al is working with, with Arab women. We will put them together, and they can help each other. This is, this is what we have to do. For example, when we're speaking about uh, Congo, Congolese people can only re depend on good, better, stronger people. We have to make a real, you cannot do alone. You need a really strong, I would say, Western power, you know, to come to you. People, people who can help uh, do the complaint, not just the Congolese, you know. And this, these are kind of things that we have to have give and take about and understand how to help each other, you know. Now, whatever you saw from today, whatever you need, a connection for, we are happy to do it. And if after, <laughs> in after, if after five years, I hear that because you met here today, you did something great, we'll be very happy, even if we didn't know about it. So um, I'll, I, I say thank you very much for coming, and thank you particularly to our brother, um, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Hannah, David Hanna. He's a great man, and he's, he's, he's doing good works, and he gave a very good understanding uh, as an opening for Caroline, but Caroline, uh, she's not working for U uh, WFWP or UPF only. She's actually the president of, she's selected out of all the people of the uh, women's, um, what's it called? Women's something. Yeah. Yeah, commissioner, uh, commissioner of the, no, no, the status of the women in the world oh. is in Geneva, yeah, okay. So that, therefore, you know, we have co to commend such people. Even she is my sister, I know her for a long time. I have, I admire her because she has done something. So everybody can feel free even to ask to get, to send somebody as a, as a what is it, um, what does she do? No, to get young people, like, for example, what is your name? Internship. Internship, yeah. What is your name? My name? Yeah. Huh? Very, very long name. 
But actually, if you want to do internship, you can write to her. It's, it's, she's got a very good, uh, you know, work, when very good um, ethics and, and put you in the right, right way. At least you could ask, you know, and you'll be given. Thank you very much for coming. And we have very many interesting events coming up. Uh, we have, uh, you, know, you know, lots of people ask us, uh, Robin and I said, why are you working so late? Why are you working all the time? <laughs> How, what makes you do it? We would like to share that with you. We have principles behind why we, what we're doing. We're not doing it just because we're two nice people. <laughs> we are doing it because we understand the, the ethics, the, the importance of this work. So therefore, if you come next January, January 21st, you could also learn about what are the principles that are guiding us. This is very important because uh, it's not just people. It's what's behind the principles behind what we're doing. So we'll, we'll invite you, those who are not have come yet, and that will be good. And we also have uh, uh, something else. December 10th. December 10th is the most important day. Yeah. It is the annual, annual meeting that we do, annual peace council. It's, and people come it's from, on, from... It's from, also on Human Rights Day. Yes. So we all have a special emphasis on human rights uh, during our... Annual Peace Council, it basically is our end of year event where we bring together all the departments of UPF and all the, the chapters around the country, yeah. well, they'll come. Yeah. So we usually end the year and kind of review a basic plan for the upcoming year. Um, yeah, and then it's good if anybody knows a human rights uh, person. Many events we put on Eventbrite, so if you found it through this, you'll through our link to Eventbrite, you can find our, many of our future events. Uh, step by step. <laughs> yeah, on the, on the 15th, on we have Elimination of Fights Against Women, and it is in Parliament, but there's very few spaces, so uh, uh, please apply if you want to. To come. lobby to Margaret. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's very few places, so sure. it, it, it means if you want to come, you must apply, you must register. And 15th of November. November. Yeah. 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 And we have another one for youth uh, later on, uh, 22nd of November. That, there, that is very limited because the youth bring people to come to the parliament. So the places are full, if you see what I mean. Somebody's getting an award, they ask five people to come, others four, another one. So therefore, the room gets feel much quicker. Uh, so, um, but it's a good thing. Then you can meet the, the uh, awardees here in, in, in Lancaster Gate. Okay, so final words. Thank you, everyone online who's, who's been participating. Oh, yes. We're very, very grateful. Thank you, David, and this, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Akta, and Faye, and Alan, and everyone else. And Trevor? <laughs> yes. Thank you. And Thank you so much. And Faye, yeah, Faye. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, thank you for Akhtar all of you who have come. And uh, we will have this at the end of, we have a monthly meeting at the end of each month. Uh, usually it's on Tuesday. the last Tuesday. But this time uh, we didn't. <laughs> we changed it a little bit. Yeah. But uh, please have a safe journey home. Yeah. Uh, feel free God to, bless to network and stay around for it. Thank you. Family picture.